How great would it be to get up close and personal with the beauty industry heroes we love and admire and to ask them, how did you learn to do what you do? I'm Chris Barron, a hairstylist and educator for 40 plus years, and I'm inviting all our heroes to chat and share the secrets of their success. Well, welcome to another week's Head Cases, and uh, this one's a little bit different because today's podcast is about the state of our industry. Why? Well, we've heard, uh, take two. Well, welcome to Head Cases, and today's podcast is a little bit different uh, than usual because this one is really about the state of our industry. Why? Well, Here's some comments that I've heard numerous times from owners, stylists, and industry leaders. Things like salons are in crisis mode, hard to find staff, staff doesn't want to work on Saturdays, there is a higher turnover of staff, 40 to 50% of the industry is going independent, they don't want to work 40 hours per week, educational events and education is changing. Clients complaining about increased prices. They're not coming in as frequently. Well, what does that mean? Well, to be real, you may have heard of all of them, or you may have just heard one or one or two, but five will get you ten that you've probably experienced one or more of those things that have happened to you. So the question to ask is, are these new trends, are they reoccurring ones or fake news? Do we conclude that our industry is in the worst shape it's ever been in, or are we primed for a pivotal shift, or are these kind of blips in our radar searching for a course correct? Do we throw our hands up in the air and say the sky is falling, to quote an old children's tale, or do we have a realistic look at where we're at and ask why? That's why I've asked and invited the person back who is qualified to talk about this. He labels himself as a dispassionate observer, and he has the background to understand our industry. He studies it, and he calls BS to fake news. This is about having an intelligent conversation about the state of our industry. So let's get into this week's head case, the forever observant and passionately dispassionate Mr. Gordon Miller. Well, Gordon, it is a pleasure to have you back on. It's been it's your second visit, so welcome yep. back to Head Cases. It's a pleasure to have you on board. I am honored, honored. Your guest list just, <laughs> I, I feel I'm not worthy. <laughs> oh, please, yeah. please. You're, it, you're, you're one of the very few. Actually, there's only two people that I've had on twice, and, and you're in that list, so you, you must rank really high with that. Oh, and I, I, and I, just want, I just want to say thank you for being here. Uh, and you and I have had some private conversations, and that's what kind of stemmed, for the people that are watching and listening now, that's what kind of stemmed this conversation. And, and if I, in the intro, if I kind of poked at your pain and, and you went, ooh, I had a little butt pucker on all this one, <laughs> That's really what that was intended about, because really what um, I wanted Gordon to talk about today, and because he's much more in tune with this than I am, but I've, I've heard all of those things that I put into that intro, and they are things that are out there. And I thought that the way that we deal with that are in our industry is just by having a conversation about it. And, you know, it's not that, Gordon, I'd, th- I'd say we're probably not going to, we're not going to give anybody magical insights into what they need to do, should do. But I think these conversations are are really important that what we look at the state of our industry and what kind of a state is it in. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it, what would, if you, and, and I want to do this just before I ask, I want to find out, get from a 35,000 foot level, kind of where you're feeling this is at. And that might not be a fair question, but I want to, <laughs> I did talk in there and I, I labeled you and uh, as uh, forever observant mm-hmm. and <laughs> passionately dispassionate. And when you and I talked about it, you, you, you talked about being a dispassionate observer. Mm -hmm. And so people get the right connotation from that. What does that tell us what you, you mean by that? Not letting my emotions and feelings, um, you know, impact what hopefully is kind of my never ending journey to find out the facts. Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of times you see things and they don't necessarily reflect your own reality, my own reality. 
um, you and I were talking just before we hit record and we are fortunate having done what we do for such a long time that we get to hang with a lot of really successful people. And if I just would put my blinders on and thought about the industry from the perspective of who I know, I would think, Oh my gosh, like this is this industry. Everybody is crazy successful and making great livings and travels the world. And, and again, we're so fortunate to know these people and I'm so happy they exist within our industry but like any industry, they don't represent everybody. And so to me, it's just important in, in what I've always done in the industry, um, especially in the last 10 years or so, is that, yeah, I can be dispassionate and I can just do my best to wander around the nooks and crannies of the industry trying yeah. to find information and then piece it all together. You know, my, my, my love when I was younger in college was economics, which is really about understanding how the parts and pieces of of the economy fit together and the story that they tell. And it's never as simple or, or or it's never as simple as we think it is. And so I apply that logic to what I do in beauty. And I, I I think I've, uh, I being dispassionate is a very important part of of doing that well. Yeah. Especially in our industry, because I can, I'm not speaking for everybody else, but I can speak for myself that somebody can poke at a nerve on me that maybe sits on a sensitive area that I might be, either not doing well in or things that I worry about or things that I keep me up at night and that can really throw me off and I don't get to think about it uh, in a rational way. Mm -hmm. I I loved what you said uh, when we were having our conversation before this, you said knowledge is power, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, but it really, it's only power if you're doing something with it. Right. Right. So I, I want people to know because we've, you've been on with us before and, and, you know, I, you know, I trust you with, anything in our business. But for the people that might not have listened before, I think it's really important that they understand a little bit about that you're not just a statistician that went to college and and university and came out to this. You've been involved in the beauty industry for X number of years. So could you just give us sort of that Reader's Digest version of where you got all of this passion for our industry about? Well, first off, um, X the X uh, equals 45 years. And only people who've done what we, you and I have done for 45 or so years would even know what Reader's Digest is. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I had to say it. Um, yeah. But, but the short version of everything was the Reader's Digest way. I'm yeah. not a hairdresser, not, never been a salon owner. Um, I've always been on the business side of beauty. I went to regular college. You know, I got a degree in investment finance and I got a minor in economics. And, and I just knew when I got out of college, that's not what I wanted to do. And then really short version of the story is I fell into beauty at age 22, went to work for a chain of cosmetology yeah. schools that led to some more things uh, in Colorado and in, in, in Utah in, in down in the weeds in the cosmetology school business, which I really learned to love very quickly. And then Leo Passage at Pivot Point found me. I spent 10 years with Leo um, left. I was vice president or one of several vice presidents there. Then I was president of Milady publishing. So I spent 20 some years in the school side of everything, education, really fell in love with it because of Leo, fell in love with hairdressers along the way. I mean, just so opposite of kind of who I am. And I think opposites yeah. are drawn to each other. And it's, it's part of my you know interest, I think, and, and, and love for this industry. And then I ran the Hairdressers Association, NCA, for 10 years, National Cosmetology Association. Uh, other stuff happened and I fell into digital and media and I was obsessed with social media, which kind of created a whole new chapter for me became publisher of American Salon and AmericanSalon.com and then CEO of Hairbrain for five years. And now I run a little company called BeautyCast Network, um, which is really focused on helping young people to end up in the first right job because we feel that's so yeah. important. And yeah, and, and along the way, I just became a, a kind of a data geek and someone who has been fortunate enough to serve on committees and boards and all kinds of things throughout the industry. And, and but never lost my interest in kind of the economics thing, that putting the puzzle together and there aren't too many people in the industry who do it and not too many people in yeah. the industry who care enough to do it. So it um, gets me in trouble from time to time. I, I say some things that upset people. But again, I try to be very, you know, fact driven and, and, and do my best to put the parts and pieces of, of the puzzle together in a way that makes sense to people. Yeah, uh, thank you. Because uh, I think that you hit the nail right on the head there. And, and one thing I will say, because I listen to your stuff too, and I and I know that y- you have talked about some some things about it. And I and I and I will tell you that I I always appreciate 
that when people will call, you pull the BS card out on some of the stuff going on in our industry, because I think it happens too much in our industry. But I think that that there's a key word that we might want to uh, touch on just before we start this, and that's the word. It might be sensitive to some people. Like mm-hmm. some of the things we're going to talk about here, I think it's, it's uh, really important that people kind of listen in the same way that we're going to give it out. This is not a conspiracy theory that we're going to talk about. It's just facts that we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. So when people listen to it, just kind of listen to it openly. You can, you know, draw your opinions later. Don't draw your opinions while the information is coming out. So with that in mind, if just from, you know, you and I've had a couple conversations on this already, because obviously you you don't just jump into this kind of a conversation Mm -hmm. for, for all you wonderful people that are out there, but um, just as an overall, if you had to say when you, when I, when uh, I just loved when you said, uh, and if I, I I don't hope I'm not stealing a line from you, and you said, but that I think your words were that our our industry you could be viewed as seeing in the worst shape that it's been in for a while, mm-hmm. and just from a from an overarching look on that, tell me where that came from. What what makes you say that? Okay, so a couple of a couple of quick thoughts. So very important to preface, I think, everything with, you know, we are a big, sophisticated industry, and we're not yes. a one-size-fits-all industry, you know. Um, we have now more categories of salons and businesses than we've ever had. And so I think it's important that as an industry evolves, that we evolve with it and how we think about it, how we talk about it. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's easy. And I think this is why people sometimes get offended by when you're trying to explain what's happening in the industry, because we talk about salons. And so when someone says there's something not quite right about salons or a category, um, then people take offense to it. Wait, that's not my experience. Um, But but again, we're big, we're complicated, and it's not one size fits all. So, so, and I think it's, it's, we're a mirror image of the larger world. And I think if we think about the larger world, we hopefully don't think of it as one size fits all. We know there yeah. economically, you know, people have different strengths and weaknesses, you know, they're in better positions and not so, so much better positions. We know in the current world, we have concerns about inflation that ripples over to what does that mean for our business, for our salons? You know, how are we yeah. adjusting? How are we not adjusting? What, what does all these things mean? So there are things happening in our larger world that absolutely impact us, a difficult economy that results down the line a little bit sometimes in a difficult economy for salons. And we are experiencing that right now um, in different parts of the industry in different ways. So economic, as an example, um, If the salon economy is difficult, then you could kind of make the assumption based on how people behave in the larger world that some are going to tighten their belts and go downstream. So you may have someone who's in that middle of the salon market getting services done and things get tight for them, for their family. So they still want to go to the salon. Perhaps they go to a lower price point. Perhaps they spread out appointments. Perhaps they start doing things at home. Perhaps they always got cut in color and they cut out the color. I mean, this is just the reality of some people's lives and multiply that times a whole lot of people when we talk about the economic trends of the country and it's going to have an impact on us. And it's important to consider that and everything else is happening in the larger world to what's happening uh, to us right now. Um, So that's number one. So I'll, I'll just, I was using it as an example, but we'll say inflation is a category that has rippled through the entire industry and depending on where you live in the industry, it may be having different effects on you. Uh, I'll add one thing to that because when you talk about any of these challenges to a listener, I would say when you hear these big challenges, they may or may not have an impact on you. Um, But at the same time they might, and you might not even know it. And then the question becomes inflation how are you internalizing what's happening in the world around us? How are you considering your price points? How are you considering your spending? How are you considering the clients who you've traditionally served and the economic challenges that they they might be facing? And do you have some understanding of that and empathy for that? um, Number one. And then number two, do you have a business plan to address those challenges? Like what are you doing? And so, you know, a, a lot of different ways to look at this. So, the economy and inflation, number one. Um, number two is that, you know, unemployment is actually at almost the lowest it's ever been. It's very, very low. 
Um, and um, which means that employers outside the industry are chasing people. Um, so yeah. especially for young people, and because big companies use Amazon as a, a classic example, um, are aggressively seeking people um, to come work for them and paying more than they've ever paid, our industry, the people who work in it, have opportunities to go elsewhere. And so yeah. we're constantly trying to bring in new talent. We have to. Every industry does. And arguably that talent pool um, is as small as it perhaps has ever been because there's just other things distracting young people who may be perfectly suited and even interested in our industry, but they're, the money's being waved over from someplace else. And that has, an, that has an impact on the talent pool itself. Another thing that's happening, again, trying to pick little categories here, is how all of us you know, um, are impacted by the information that's flowing through the world. We've never had so much information coming towards all of us. And whether it's inside the industry or out, social media has allowed a lot of information to flow in ways it's never has before, including misinformation. And then beyond misinformation, there's kind of like what I consider aspirational information. Those are the conversations we often have in the industry about all the great opportunities there are and how people can make just amazing livings and and do great work. Um, But often... As that gets talked about, it doesn't have necessarily kind of guardrails around it. So a young person might experience a lot of conversations about six-figure hairdressers. That may set them up for the expectation because they don't have enough information to think, well, I should be there really quickly. And then sometimes yeah. cer- certain, t- certain people, certain types of people um, who, who are hearing things, um, maybe just the way that they process information, the way they understand things, their expectation is I got to get there fast and they feel like they're failures if they don't get there fast enough and that they leave unexpectedly. And, and often people leave the industry for reasons we don't even understand. They just don't show up to work one day. And so yeah. you've got perhaps potentially more turnover than we've ever seen um, and more kind of listening to all that information that's out and around us and, and grabbing onto bits and bites of it that feel like they may suit their needs or, or reinforce their insecurities or, 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 you know? And so I think that's another giant um, category of concern is all the information that too often young people without context are hearing and it potentially can set them up for failure. Um, Another thing I think another category would be, and this one kind of connects to what I just said, that's mentorship. And we maybe Um, talked about this last time, Chris, I don't remember, but I think that we, have a shortage of mentors and it's significant. Um, You and I grew up in an industry that I think always believed in the power of mentors. And it just was such a big fundamental part of building a career that you had connections with people that you had people who were around you sometimes who kind of help you get to the next step. It was imperfect. It was very casual in, in many ways, but it was just kind of part of the industry and how things operated as we've had a giant shift towards independence, the mentorship kind of falls by the wayside in some ways because you're no longer in the physical facility where a mentor could be two chairs over. Right. Or an owner who took mentorship seriously, um, worked to make sure you were in an environment where mentors existed. So when you kind of just think about that and think about the move towards independence, it kind of makes perfect sense that we would have fewer being mentored because we just don't have the infrastructure for it. And if mentorship for decades has been part of the secret sauce that gets you to success, well, what does that mean for everybody? And I believe what it means is the potential for shorter careers and greater, greater failures. Because I, I know for me in my life and, and I can go through decades and it's, it's, it's not one mentor. It's a series of mentors, including today. Mentorship is actually is key to having the good career that I've had and always being open to continue to have new mentors as my life has evolved. And I, I see a a serious shortage that concerns me because mentors important to anybody listening are not role models. They're not the people out there on social media that are watching. Those are all great, but mentors are people we can talk to. Mentors are people who, who we have a relationship with of some sort. It can be digital. It can be way you can have a mentor by way of a zoom. You know, it doesn't have to be someone you work with. But I think we have fewer and fewer of those kind of relationships than we've ever had. And that concerns me. Um, you want me to keep going? I've got more. Oh, no. Go. I, I, well, I've still got, I have some questions along the way, but I'm taking notes here. 
You want to stop so for some questions going. and I'll go. Well, listen, back. maybe just while we're yeah. on that mentorship thing, I just want to, you know, and, and I want to preface this by saying I'm longer in the tooth than probably long uh, all the people watching and listening right now, probably some of you combined. <laughs> and I don't want to be that baby boomer that is going, well, well, the way that we did it when it was way back then in the dark ages. Yep. All of, but what I want to do is just a simple observation uh, with that I think is um, it. It, um, it says exactly what you're talking about there is when, um, when we had a, when we had mentors that came in, when we had assistants, associates, whatever the name that you wanted to call yeah. them. And as like, I've always said, you don't, you pick your mentor, you can have a coach, but you yeah. pick your, the, the, you pick your mentor, the mentor isn't assigned uh, another conversation. But what you did is you would do the things that you can't do now, or that most people won't do now. You had evening. You had evening sessions. Right. You didn't. You didn't pay the educator. You, the people that were part of it came to do it just because they wanted to learn, and they didn't have other things going on. Well, they had if they had other things going on, and then they would put them off. So there was a lot of education that came out of it, and that mentorship thrived from there, and people grew because of that. Yep. And 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 this is one thing I'd throw out to you because I think you're way more knowledgeable on this than I am. But I, I I don't know if it was COVID that hit it. Was it before? Did it start before? But COVID really managed uh, or exacerbated that. Yes. I don't want to do any more than I have to do. I want work life balance, all of that. Can you kind of what what what's your take on that? Ooh, that's a loaded question <laughs> mm. for a fellow old guy. Um, yeah. The um. Oh, um I think that big picture. So let me start by let's talk about generations for a moment. I, th- I think that's yeah. a fascinating conversation. As, as a couple of guys who've been around for a bit, we have we have lived through the evolution of multiple generations. Mm-hmm. And I can say that when I was a kid, um, you know, eighteen, my parents thought my generation was completely crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and we thought they were crazy and the things that they were doing yep. and how they were doing them were not the ways that we wanted to live our lives. Now we didn't have social media we didn't have digital media. The world moved at a slower pace, you know? So, but the reason I say that is to say to anybody, you know, who's, who's looking at this generational issue and, and the, the way that we're working our way through it is it's, it's not anything new. It's just, everything's moving at a faster pace and information is yeah. flowing faster. But I think some of the ideas about creating success Probably if we, if we were able to bring, you know, Vidal back and, and talk to what it took to be successful in the 50s and 60s, the pillars would probably be very similar. How we go about doing them is different because we live in a different time. We have different tools. We have different technology. Information flows a different way. But I, I really truly believe that today how you build success in this industry, it's not very different than anything I've observed because again, I'm an observer. I'm not the hairdresser. Um, It's basically all the same stuff. And so I think the question becomes for all of us, as we kind of take maybe the one good thing that came out of COVID, you know, which is, I, I think so many of us taking the time to step back and look at our lives and say, do we have balance? Um, Mm -hmm. whatever that means for each of us. And I I think that's important to say, because I I think balance is a very individual thing. Um, And I think we have to sort it out based on the lives we have. Do we have children? Do we not have children? You know, what else is important to us in our lives? You know, it's it's a complicated, you know, conversation with ourselves and those that we love. Um, But I think that, again, the, the, the pillars of success haven't really changed. So if you feel that, you know, three days work is, is it for you because of the rest of your life. And that's, what's going to make you happy. Then the question becomes, well, what does success look like potentially for you within three days? And that's okay. I think for a lot of younger people, I, I, I would say that mathematically that's back to the dispassionate part, right? Mathematically, when we talk about the current way the industry is, there's a, there's a big movement towards less time and more money. Yeah. And that's a challenging formula. And I think some people can get there. And the people I see getting there easiest, they're just kind of unicorns. They're going to be successful no matter what. They were born to be successful. They're, they're a rare breed. The rest of us have to work a little harder. And so I would just say to everybody that as we 
as, as, as society changes and what we care about changes, that we just have really um, awareness of, of what it takes and find, again, those role models, those mentors that can get us there. Because I, I think one of the biggest drivers in, in the boundaries around time today, and I give young people credit for this, is saying, hey, if I'm in a salon 40 hours, but I'm only working 24, like, what am I here for? I don't want to, I should be able to work fewer hours because I'm actually not busy enough to convince myself that showing up 40 hours is the life I want to live. And maybe I don't see how I'll ever get there. Again, maybe lack of mentorship, maybe the lack of that person around me, that coach who could say, you're on your way, you will get there. Um, So, and I think that is a huge driver for what's happened. Big, big picture, the industry I believe from all the the math over the years before pandemic that we were operating at about 60% of our potential um, to do services. Meaning if you take the whole industry and put us all together and then take all the clients that we take care of and look at our capacity to do work, which is, you know, if, if I, if I have six openings today, that's my capacity. If I have three clients, that's my productivity. I'm at 50%. I believe mm-hmm. the industry has been at 50, 60% for, for a very long time, which means that before the conversations about boundaries, we were just kind of going along doing what we've always done, which is having a lot of folks in salons working who didn't have clients to keep them busy. And yeah. I think as we came out of pandemic and watched education and other things change and again, saw this lack of mentorship, I think, I think a certain type of logic kicked in for a lot of people, which is just that I don't know why I'm here, not busy and missing out on the rest of my life. And I think that's a big driver as to what we're in the midst of, which concerns me because we are an industry that in 2019, the PBA did a study and we were 61% part-time. Today, I would argue that it seems like we must be at at least 70% part-time. And the question there is, are we part-time because we want to be part-time? And are we part-time for other reasons? We're not busy enough to be full-time. And we can be confused about the answer to that, by the way, you know, uh, because again, for a lot of people, it's not so much a thought process. It's it's just like, you know, we're hearing all the talk of, of, um, of, 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 of getting of how we can potentially get as much out of less. And I just don't see many proof points around it, which is why I have concerns about this particular category. Yeah. And and it's like you said, it's, it's not that we can have people listening. They're going, well, I do it. I've I've been there, but not everybody can do that. If you're, if you're an, an outgoing personality, you know, and you, you do the things that like what they used to tell you in, in, um, even like 30, 40 years ago, we'll go out and hustle. You know, they would say hand out business cards, but today that means get on your social media and advertise. But it's like if you're a shy person or maybe you're suffering from imposter syndrome yep. that's out there for right now, then you might not you might not be feeling good about that. And I think that's where the mentorship comes in. That's where the owner comes in. Yes. And that's sometimes, and, and, and I know that, listen, there's owners out there probably – 95% of the owners are out there working behind the chair and they have to, you know, because it's obviously it's a generation a money generator. Yep. But the reality is, is that when we own the business that it's, we don't often have time for that mentorship or the mentorship would have to take pass after hours when everybody is tired. Yep. And that's part of the reason why I, I think that there's so much of this talk and I'd love to hear you, your take on it. Um, and I apologize if I'm constantly throwing curves no, at you it. here, but it is when we talk to people about that there, if you're behind the chair and you're the visionary and you're the owner, whether that is for three, 10, 200 people, are you making time uh, to share your vision, to help, to grow, to help coach, to, you know, pass out um, um, accountability when it's needed to, you know, so I'd love to hear your take on that. Okay. So, um, the independence movement, I'm going to kind of connect the dots here. There's something else we talked about. Um, the barrier to entry to ownership has never been lower. So you want to be an owner, you can be an owner today. Easier than ever. Um, and some of it, interestingly, you know, it's not just the independence side. Um, coming out of COVID, 
you know, real estate changed dramatically. There was a lot of empty space. I, I know quite a few hairdressers who left established salons, went and opened not a suite, but got a couple of people together, went and opened a little salon, and ended up paying less rent than they would pay in the suite. Pre-pandemic, that wasn't going to happen. And so yeah. there was a lot of just excess real estate, a lot of new opportunities for people. And I would argue that um, there was somewhat of a natural path in the past that, you know, you worked for a while, you got a certain level of experience, it doesn't make it right, you know, that it took more time. But the longer you kind of do the craft, the longer you work, you know, in a salon, I think the more opportunity you have to figure out where do you want to take yourself? You know, it's just not listening to all the voices on social media. It's like, oh, I think because so many young people I knew when I was working in beauty schools for years, pretty much everybody wanted to own a salon someday. And then yeah. people would get into the salon and they'd have a little bit of a reality check. You know, do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? And time would, would help you, I think, find hopefully, you know, a path to your passions. Um, I think we have more people in salons than ever that don't necessarily have yet the experience to, to know how to be a mentor. Um, they don't have perhaps the training to be a coach. And I believe you have to be trained to be a coach. You have to go out and yeah. learn how to be a coach, different than a mentor, just like you have to yeah. learn how to be an educator. Um, and, and, but the barriers to entry of everything have come down. So you have the opportunity to, to fill different roles without necessarily the skill. And again, the concern there is, you know, what is the failure rate, you know, a, across some of these categories? And also, what does it mean, you know, for any business entity? You know, you, you open a salon, you're younger, perhaps, you don't quite have all the skills yet. And so there's also, there's a chance you'll be very successful. There's a chance you won't. There's a chance you'll bring people into your organization. You'll grow them. There's a chance you won't, you know? And so, it, again, things can get a little messy. So I think as we see more and more salons that are owned by less experienced people, just because of the nature of the world we live in today, that brings more risks to the larger industry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, I, and I think, you know, just, it, it came to my mind, because you and I had this conversation beforehand about the state of our industry. And, and you know, and uh, I thought I heard you say that, that the other day that it was 70% was was independent but could you get, give us the facts again on that because i sure. i want to talk to just about you know something that my uh one of my teachers talked to me about the four quadrants of business and i and i but i'd first like to get your take on the numbers because i think you yeah. have that background where you actually know the stats on that or get them or close to that so could you give us the when you when yeah. that misinformation that i had on 70 percent was independent yeah, it's not 70% independent. You know, it's, it's, you know, big picture when you look at everybody, you know, who's licensed, who works in salons or everybody who's working in salons. Um, about 20%. And, and let me, let me say this first about numbers. Um, we're an industry that's not good at numbers. What I've been fortunate in, in what I've done that because I've done it for such a long time. And I have so many connections in the industry. I'm a power networker. I talk to the biggest brands. I talk to the smallest brands. I talk to the new brands. I talk to the legacy brands. I talk to distributors and I'm forever piecing together the puzzle of beauty um, because mm -hmm. so much of, of the information that we should have would hope that we would have readily available to all of us. It just isn't there. And so you're constantly piecing it together. Many of the big corporations know it all, but because they're privately held, they don't want to release that information. It might help their competitor. So I'm always, you know, cobbling things together. In, in terms of the cobbling together of, of the workforce, about 20% have historically, and we know this is a fact, about 20% has been owners of salons. So these are self-employed people, most of them licensed hairdressers themselves, not all, but most of them, and they own salons. Yeah. Adding to the self-employed category, are the renters. Renters have always been self-employed people. Uh, historically, most of them rented a chair in a salon. The person who owned that salon is self-employed. Everybody who rents a chair in that same salon are self-employed. So you can have 10 self-employed people in one salon. So again, 20% or so are self-employed salon owners. And then the other category of self-employment are renters of chairs, renters of booths, and renters of suites. And that yeah. number of everybody is approaching 50%. So the 50 plus the 20, that's all self-employed people would be 70% approximately. And then approximately 30% what's left over. Those would be commissioned predominantly you have a very tiny percentage of uh, that. Nobody's ever been able to even say what it is 
of people who are what are called team-based pay. So they're getting like a salary. Um, but that 30% is more than likely commission stylists working for self-employed owners. Right. Yeah. And to that point, and I want to make this kind of very, th- this was, um, I just found this fascinating in- information and, and I, I am a bit of a chihuahua data freak when it comes to that too. I, I often don't retain all of it, but I, I love data. Um, but one of my teachers talked about the four quadrants of business. And if you go, obviously the upper and the lower, the left and the right quadrants and on the left-hand side at the top left, you've got employee base. That would have been me when I worked in a salon, I was in a commission-based salon. Uh, and then I, and then after that, I said, well, look at, look at the business. I want to own my own business. So I dropped down into the bottom left where I started my own business. Mm-hmm. And, but the reality was on that left-hand side, everything you're doing is based on how much money you can earn in a given amount of time. In other words, dollars for hours. Mm-hmm. And even when at the very beginning, when we started our business, when I didn't have a lot of business sense, it was still how much money could our salon make per hour. Yeah. And if it didn't make that nut, then I had to take out of what I put in or what I came to my draw and I had to put it into the business. So in essence, what that my teacher always talked to me is that you've got the people that are employees or sometimes you have, you bought a business, but you really just bought yourself a job. Right. And it's not till you move over to the other side where on the upper right-hand quadrant, you have business and on the bottom right, you have investor where you can actually own a business you, other people are working for you. You're not necessarily, you know, they're working for you. You're supplying the vision. You're supplying the direction, the motivation, the mentorship. And they, and they, and to, to be clear, I'm going to add this in. I don't want to go off on a tangent on it, but people will come and go, but they're all working for you and they're all making money for you and the business. And and making, and that way, good life go ahead. Themselves and making good life. Yes. Themselves. Yes, and then they can take that money that they've got, the profit margins, they can invest that and make, and that's more making money where your sleep, where it's when, when your sleeping comes from. Yep. But I think that's the part that I'm hearing you talk about so much of our business is on that left-hand side of that quadrant where you're either, regardless of where you're at, with the owner, the booth rent, the independent salon in suites where there's still just money per hour and how can they do that? And I think there's a there's a shift in there where, how do we get some of those people over to becoming more of that mentorship side, helping other people grow so that they're actually making money for you? Now, I don't know if that was just a whole lot of talk that I threw in there, mm-hmm. uh, but that was insightful for me when I understood it and, uh, and, and then how to move from one to the other. This episode is sponsored by the Salon Associate Accelerator from trainersplaybook.com. Are you struggling with the time and cost of associate training? Do you feel like your salon is running you? We'll get your associates on the floor, all with 90% less time from you, so you can get back to building your business. Get them world-class design, finishing, color, and client care skills they'll use every day for the rest of their career, while you focus on realizing your vision. Go to trainersplaybook.com and get the Salon Associate Accelerator. And now, back to the show. You said that you had, you, 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 caught, you talked about the economy, inflation, unemployment, uh, the info overload in social media, and mentorship. And you said there was a couple of other points on there. Oh, what were those other points? Um <laughs> they will come back See, to me in a moment. Ask me another question. Yeah. Well, well, let let's just deal, let's just j- jump on one of those right yeah. now. Is because you know we've been talking about you were talking about pricing, and yeah. and you said something to me that the other day that I found really interesting that were you had never noticed it before, but you said people were um, were having hissy fits over the pricing that was happening and. In businesses right now, consumers, you know, and, and all the yeah. rest of it just came back to me, thankfully. So yeah. we'll, we can go there in a moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's always important for any business that engages with the public to be a business, right? So, you know, and that's what we do. Without the public, there's nothing for us to do. Yeah. So, consumer sentiment, how consumers feel about life, about, um, services, if you're in the service business, which we are in one category of many, um, how they feel about the money in their pockets and how they're going to spend that money. We know coming out of pandemic that 
a lot of people kind of came to some new conclusions about how to spend their money and what to do with it. Um, so I think um, coming out of pandemic, it's, it's really interesting. So the industry, it feels like we gave ourselves permission, which is a good thing, to raise prices in ways which we've never done before. And I think both of us would, would, would believe that we've never been good as an industry of, of charging our worth. It's been a forever right. conversation. And it feels like coming out of pandemic, you know, after, you know, a few years of, of all that pain, we said, you know what, it's time for us to charge more. What does that mean? You know, that, and that's where I think, you know, the industry, a lot of confusion happened. And so we saw all kinds of things happening. Um, a lot of people didn't adjust their prices, same fear that maybe held them back in the past. Some got overly confident. We saw 20, 30, 40% price increases happening, especially in the, this category, which there is no data on that even I can find, um, which is moving from a traditional pricing menu to hourly pricing. And there you saw right. a lot of stylists who went over there, kind of did what they did. Some of them didn't even realize, I experienced this in a few conversations where they did it, they struggled with it. They were thinking about going back and they talked to people like me and they're going, I don't, I don't understand. Like I, I didn't change that much, but I'm losing clients like crazy, but I went to hourly pricing. And so let's, let's figure out that math. And I'm like, well, you increased your prices over 35%. No, I didn't. And so sometimes we make these big changes. There's a ripple effect. The ripple effect of hourly pricing is one that has reached the press. Washington Post did a big article on it of, of, of kind of pushback from clients. And if you pay attention to TikTok and all the conversations that are happening on TikTok about hairdressers and salons from consumers who are frustrated with what they see as pricing uh, gouging, um, it doesn't mean that's what we're doing as an industry. These are, again, solo conversations. Again, got to think about yes, the big exactly. picture. But, but there's a lot of negative buzz in the consumer space about salons today. And it has to do with what are perceived as challenges with pricing from a consumer point of view, you know, just a rapid yep. increase in their own personal circumstances, which they then take their social media megaphone and blow up, you know? So it's interesting, but I, I, I think we should never lose sight of, of who we serve, which are yeah. The public. Yeah. Especially when you, when you tie that back into so the socioeconomic conditions that are happening with, you know, unemployment or the, the economy the way it is right now. And they perceive, you know, they, they, they're just going to look at bottom line. What did it cost? Cost me $10 the last time, cost me $15 now. Yep. So, exactly. you know, that's at the end of the game. So they're still going to look at that. Some people, you know, you might, well, I love Gordon and Gordon does a great job on my hair. And so it's $5 more. What the hell? I'm just going to keep going. Yep. But if it means a difference between putting some food on the plate for my kids, exactly. then Gordon's going to have to, I can't afford Gordon anymore. Exactly. So it's like the other thing that I heard that's out there right now. And, and for a while, you know, and I, because I'm traveler and, and pardon my language, but I always get pissed off when, when uh, I go and they'll say, well, it's, it's weekend. So airfare costs more, or I've got to spend twice as much on a, on a, uh, the same room at a hotel yeah. room and so on. Yeah. And I heard people talking about, um, okay, we should have, on pick your day. Now, I, when I was, you know, hot in the, in the salon, Saturdays were the always. Yep. Now I understand it's like Mondays or Tuesdays right. that are really busy in the salon. But they said that if you have people that want to work, and that's the, maybe the next act uh, where I'd like to go because we talked about how that people sometimes don't want to work five days a week. Well, it, can you accommodate them in different areas? Right. But if you've got Monday and Tuesday are busy days, my, just my, for, for this example, and there's people that are saying, well, you should have like a 50% bump on your uh, charges on that day because that's your busy days. And right. therefore, that's, <laughs> excuse me, the supply and demand. And, and so those people, if you don't want to, if you don't want to work on, on sat on Sunday, or, I'm sorry, if you don't want to work on Monday or Tuesday, then you got to work on another day when you're going to be making less money. What, what thoughts on that? Cause I think there's a lot of stuff out there that either is right or wrong. And some of us just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, back to where we just left off, you know, consumer sentiment is really important in this one because if you decide you yeah. want to, implement a, a pricing structure where certain days for the same service are higher perhaps because of demand. You know, you have to be thinking about when you implement the clients that I currently see 
How are they going to react to it? That's number one. Yeah. Number two, I think we always have to consider the larger behavior of humans, you know? And so like what you just described is very real, but it's interesting because it's, it's changed over time. You and I have been traveling for a very long time. Um, and it was pretty much a conversation that, you know, um, traveling on certain days, you knew it was going to be a lot more. That's changed radically. It's not that way anymore. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, and the airlines and the hotels never really made a big marketing deal of stay on these days and pay more or pay less. It's kind of implicit in there. And, and then what most people I don't think realize about those two industries is they are very big and very sophisticated. The airlines, the yeah. computer systems, when you look at pricing, they're, they, they're looking at inventory and the prospects of selling it and adjusting prices to fill up every plane they can fill up. And they, yep. the computers have algorithms that help them determine that price. And if you've ever you know, tried to plan a trip and you kind of start early and you, you look at all the prices today and you go back and you look again two days from now, they're different. And it's because yeah. the inventory is forever moving. So it's almost like an auction kind of process. And the sophistication of the modeling that they use is what allows it to succeed. And so we're talking about something that's very kind of fundamental and basic in your business. So I would question whether your clients, which only you know, are going to react positively or negatively to yeah. that. Yeah. So I, I think it's a interesting conversation. Um, uh, it doesn't excite me, you know, um, to be honest. But I think if you're that really busy, busy salon, maybe there's a way that that would make sense for you. But you kind of have to look. I mean, I, I really think it's about, again, back to that whole capacity versus productivity, how much of your book is open and, yeah. and, and yeah. how do you fill it? And do you fill it by changing pricing by day? Do you fill it by having a better conversation with every client? Do you fill it by way of your marketing? And, and by the way, you know, you mentioned, you know, the, the old school business card versus like social media today. The one thing that was shockingly kind of positive for me coming through pandemic was talking to so many people in the industry coming out of COVID who said, oh my gosh, I'm, my business is being driven first and foremost by actual human interaction. I have doubled down on word of mouth. I'm talking to more people. I am handing out business cards. I am saying to my clientele, refer, refer somebody to me. I'd love to have you know this, that, or the other. Old school word of mouth, I think, is as powerful as it's ever been because social has become so big. I'm, I'm completely pro-social marketing. I've been a proponent for a really long time. But I think we're living in interesting times and I think you need to double down on both. And I think um, I've been pleasantly surprised to have so many conversations ongoing. Cause I'm always asking the question, where are you getting new clients from? And I'm just hearing from so many, it really is that human interaction that's driving their business yeah. forward more than anything. And I also am hearing more than any, more than perhaps ever, just how important the quality of, of service is um, not, not the quality of the hair service, but the quality of everything else, because there's a lot of great hair happening out there. And for a consumer, somebody like me, I, I don't understand this, but I do yeah. understand how you make me feel. Yeah. I, and I can't remember if I've talked to so many people lately that I don't, I, I thought it was you and I, that we're having a bit of this conversation, but correct me if I'm wrong. And if not, it's valid. Um, I was talking to someone and they just said, you know, that, that of all the times that they've had their hair cut and talked to people about having their hair cut, not one person in this, from the salon called them back and said, you know, are, is your service good? Is mm -hmm. it, are you getting the service you want? Are you, are you happy with what's being done? And, and that might contribute to, uh, so two questions. Number one, was it you? Yeah. Number two, uh, well, in, in that regard, but if you think about yeah. it. No, I, I don't disagree we've got with it, We've got an opportunity that if somebody, that one the slightest thing, you know, well, my, the massage that I had in the shampoo wasn't quite what I'm used yeah. to, so that we can rectify it. I just think that, that when you're, you sparked that, when you said about this human interaction that's happening again and, and, yep. and just connecting with that, with that customer to make them a loyal trusting and valuable customer that sees the value in you. And what we know is that 70% of clients don't get past the third appointment. That's a data yeah. point that the, all the software 
companies that track appointments, they all pretty much end up in the same place. I usually hear like 67, 68% is the number who don't come back after the third appointment. And I think it's a hard thing sometimes for us even to relate to because we don't typically in a salon realize that somebody hasn't come back yeah. until a long time later. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. what happened to so-and-so? I haven't seen so-and-so. Or we don't even think about it. And so it's hard to get clients to come for that first time and to think that that number, which has been constant for, for, for a very long time now, um, that, that's a huge miss. And I think it's a number almost anybody could improve by doing something as simple as what you just suggested, Chris. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's interesting, you know, the more that you and I talk about this, and whether it's, you know, like even in, when I introduced you, I talked about, is this just stuff that is, is new and we're just hearing about it for the first time or has it been around forever and we're just recycling mm -hmm. that same problems that, that still come up? Uh, but what's interesting there is because the world is always changing is that the solutions today might be different than before. Yeah, and bingo. potentially more effective. You know, there's more yeah. opportunity to reach out to people in, in unique ways. So I, I, I think, yeah, you ask a, a really interesting question. Yeah, and, and you know, do you think that that it, it, that are we as an industry? And I think it's always a trickle down. You know, like when I first started off in the business, it wasn't like I was going out to all the business gurus and saying, "What are you doing in your business, and how does that apply to me?" But that was then when I was at that stage. But now I get to talk to a lot of people outside our business and they go, damn, that's really, really good advice for in our business. Mm -hmm. Do you find, is, is that trickle down effect all the way across our board? Or do you find that there's more of outside information outside of our beauty information that's coming in and utilized in our, in our, in our business? I, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, there's always been those people in the industry, and a lot of them very well-known people, you know, who yeah. have focused on the outside. Um, yeah. You know, um, I'm trying to think of um, oh, the McCormick's uh, from Houston, um, you know, um, Salon Visage, I believe. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, famous for, you know, yeah. looking outside the industry always to find great ideas to bring into the industry. Lydia Sarfati, who's really big in the skincare world, you know, she loves, she talks about the four seasons and, you know, just these amazing experiences and how do you kind of find metaphorically a way to bring that into beauty. So I, I think, you know, it's always been there and I think there's those who have done it today. You know, it's interesting. I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't feel like I hear enough of that talk anymore, you know, and I think, again, we're inundated with so much information. I think sometimes it's, it's hard to eat. It's like a fire, you know, fire hose of, of stuff coming our way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, we had an era of, of what I refer to as the TSA year is the salon association. And that yeah. was a, an organization that was part of PBA started maybe 15 years or so ago. And um, they're not around anymore, but out of that era, which was a group of really progressive salon owners who brought all kinds of talent, some of the greatest authors on the planet who had nothing to do with our industry, but they brought them to us. And we hear yeah. that Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote The Tipping Point, was what I remember yeah. really well. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that was kind of an era that I, I, I wonder where that went to, you know. So I, yeah. I, I think you bring up something really powerful and important. I don't know the answer, but I think we, we will only be we will only benefit if we do more of that. And, and yeah. we live in a world where we can all do that. YouTube. Every single day of my life, I try to watch at least one new YouTube video that has nothing to do with the industry, but has to do with other passions yeah. in my life, which as a workaholic, it usually connects back to beauty somehow. TED Talks and you know, just yes. all the great stuff that's out there. We have there's so much for all of us you know, to avail yeah. ourselves. It doesn't cost us anything but a little bit of time. And so I, 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 I think we're probably doing less of what you suggested. And I think I'll just say the opportunities is there for us to do more right now. Yeah. Like, I, and I just, I think as a correction and, and maybe you can correct me or I can, I just want to make sure the names get out there. Cause I think Salon Visage, that was the Gambuzas, right? Oh, that's the Gambuzas who were just as interesting. The Gambuzas. Yes. Salon, yes. Yeah, Salon Visage, that's the Gambuzas in, in, um, yeah. Kentucky. And the McCormick's, McCormick's were we're in Houston. Yeah. And it's um, a big, big organization. Oh my gosh. I'm, I'm embarrassed. I'm yeah. Gonna it's a, we're going to have to, we're going to have to look that up. And, yeah. and if they, if they, if they do listen to this, we apologize that we can't remember yeah. the small name. And give you a plug. <laughs> yeah. But you know, like to your point, I think the thing that I've, I've tried to pass on to some of the people is, is when it comes to profitability that uh, uh, the, 
the book Profit First mm-hmm. and by uh, Mike Michalowicz, you know, as and I think that if the average salon owner would just listen to that and then instead of just doing a forensic accounting where uh, where your uh, expenses, uh, your income minus expenses equal profit and you do income minus profit equals expenses and just then lay out what you can afford mm-hmm. to have as an expense makes a big difference yeah. in what you can take home. But so that's where kind of my, my feeling on this, if we can take some stuff that's working on businesses as a whole outside and bring that into our businesses. So, and, and I can speak, I, I understand where everybody's at out there because being that creative entity, I, I got my juice from doing hair. I got my juice from the client. I, you know, all of that was really, really important to me. Yep. And sometimes I did that at the expense of not understanding my business really well. Inter- that's so and, interesting. Yeah. 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 And, and- um, so I, I'm interested because the you said you had a couple more points that were in there. Well, category, and, the categories of, of the industry yes. changing, you know, I'll, I'll just say them and you can pick whichever ones are interest. So education yeah. as a category has radically evolved. So that's a big one. Events, which have some connection to education, but not all of its education. Events have evolved. Um, I think that's an important one. The media space has radically evolved as a big part of the media space for a very long time. It's even, So there's three that look very, very differently or look very different today than they did five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what, like if you had to say top line, how do you think that's affected us? Like what, like the overall, what, like what, okay, cause effect, what happened and what's the cause to us? There's less of all of it. So, so less of all of it means, you know, less opportunity perhaps for as many people as I would hope to come in contact with good stuff by way of each of those categories. You know, so yeah. on the event side, coming out of pandemic, you know, we have the big beauty shows. They've had some evolution um, in terms of the vendors who show up at the shows, some, some evolution, you know, of the attendees themselves. Um, we saw some kind of shrinking of some of the smaller events and regional stuff. So I, I would say, you know, the events are very important. Um, yeah. I feel like we kind of saw a shrinking of the conference space, which is kind of the deep yeah. events, you know, where you can go not just to buy things, but can go to, to take some really deep education. And I feel like, you know, we've kind of, that era has kind of somewhat slipped away. We still have some of it, but not as much as we used to. And the, the bigger events, and I love all, I, I love any time I can get together with hairdressers, whether it's five people or, you know, 500 or, you know, 5,000 or, or many, many more. Um, The big events I feel like are evolving more into kind of cash and carry events um, where you go buy your tools. um, First and foremost, they become really great places to go buy tools and they're really necessary. So it's, it's great, but I feel like not as many people are going to them. And I, and I think that's a loss in whatever that might look like going to less opportunities to engage with your fellow hairdressers is a loss. And if collectively fewer people are going to all the big shows, then there's some loss. Education, which kind of there's a dotted line to that, I, I, but I, there's so much more in the education space and the education that happens at the big beauty shows. We've seen the brands kind of pull back on education in many ways. And, and maybe pullback's not a fair way of saying it. It's different. It's different. Yeah. Um, and so some of the big brand events are gone. They've been replaced with smaller regional events. Not necessarily a bad thing, you know, but, but different. Um, and I think that there's been a huge... Uh, belief by many, myself included, that digital education would step in and 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 allow more people to learn. Um, I don't think that's panned out the way I hoped it would have. I think we have a ways to go before we get there. Um, and so I, I, I think that's the challenge. So we saw a shrinking of real-time education. I, I think we did see an expansion of digital education, but the digital education wasn't what people were looking for. And I don't yeah, think yeah. that's a commentary on digital it's a commentary on us not understanding it yet. And I, yeah. I still think it will become a really meaningful solution. Maybe when the hardware catches up and, and we, we can do augmented reality and VR. And so, you know, I think the jury is, is out. Um, so the education space and then media, we just have less of it than we've ever had. It's very different. A lot of it's been replaced by social media. Um, you were talking about you know, earlier in your career, you know, kind of how, how things worked. Um, media was a really big and important part of our world, you know, 20 years ago. Um, it's where we yeah. got all of our information. Social media has forever changed that. Um, but I think what it also did was kind of move us away from kind of the, the deeper content, you know, the, 
um, and, and things just became a little bit more surfacey. Um, and so yeah. it's great. You can be inspired by it, but we've lost a lot of kind of deeper dives into information that the media was really good at during a certain era. Um, things in the media began to kind of shift 2008, 2009, following the big recession. And so most of the media, which was print back then, was reduced 25 to 30%. The pages just went away because the yeah. economics changed it. That was the beginning of the, the end of magazines as we have known them. And the move into digital um, has just been... Um, a lot of value has been lost. A lot of information has been lost. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, and, and that's not to say it needs to be the way it was, but it feels like the interest in going deep into content um, has been greatly diminished and we need deep content. You know? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, in, I love what you're saying there because I'll, I'll give you my, just my experience and I'll, I'm going to take it. This is the time when I'm going to, the long in the tooth, gray haired dude, I mean, really, I'm actually really handsome, but I'm trying to draw this picture of you. Yes, with, you are. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm six foot five. Uh, I have dark hair, gray hair, very suave and demoner. But I'm, mm. you know, it, the reality is gray hair. You know, lots of wrinkles. But from that era, where when we would go to a show, you would buy the DVDs or yes. VHS tapes, yep. and they were they were long, and you would it was a one hour of how to do um, a haircut and a, and a blow dry and possibly a color at the same time. Yep. And the interesting part is, is I find that that was me then, but even now I'm on that swipe left society. If I'm not getting what I want right now, yep. I'm swiping left out of it. And I'm wondering where that leads us to where we've, we've had what we had where it was like good hardcore content you, where you got a lot of information and, and, and sometimes the bones of what really made it happen. And we're now, I need, I know even with our company, we're big into providing content for, uh, for training programs, et cetera. But I have to go back in and say, look at where's the fine line between where I give you meat and that swipe left. Yeah. So, uh, and it's, and it's a tough journey to be on for a producer or developer of product right now. Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen to this? Because I think there's got to be a hybrid that comes out somewhere, somewhere along the line where people are going to go, because we all know you can go on TikTok as much as you want. You can go on Facebook. You can go on all of those. And there's wonderful stuff that's on there. Yeah. But you can't get your questions answered. Right. So how do we get to that point where we've got education that you can get? It is online. It is whatever it is. I mean, a lot of the events are even go to more of a TikTok format. Yeah. You know, instead of having a two hour, they went to one hour 45 and now they're down sometimes down to 30 minutes. Yep. How do you get, how do you get, so you can get meat and not just one, two tidbits out of it. I'm, I'm not sure what that is. Well, I mean, first and foremost, you've got to have leadership in this space um, because it, it, I think we said this before, but, but, but education has long been seen mm -hmm. as the biggest driver of success in the industry. So yes. if we see education being diminished, we all should be concerned, um, yeah. number one. And then, yeah, how do we deal with that? Well, some of it's the times we're living in, you know? So, you know, we don't have the attention spans, perhaps, that we've had. Tied to everything else we've talked about, you know, more people working part-time, um, more people without mentors. And many of those mentors are the ones who said, go, go see that class, go sit in that classroom, save up your money, go, go, go take a trip to... LA, you know, and, and, and sit with Chris Barron and, and learn. And, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, another form of boss um, because demand for the good stuff, I think is probably lowest ever. But yeah. I also think we're, we've become kind of an industry where not everybody even has the context to understand what the good stuff looks like. And so I think it is one of the greater challenges the industry faces today is that, I think like much of the world, we in many ways are less educated than we've been in the past, you know, um, and it, it's just kind of the way it is. And so things are going to have to change in the larger world, I think, to make education more attractive um, to all of us to want to spend our time and money to go get it. And, yeah. and I think, you know, there's a dumbing down of the industry that's kind of happened and it's not good. And it doesn't mean, again, individually to the listener, you know, that, that you've been dumbed down. But I think we should all be 
concerned, you know, with the state yeah. of the industry education and do enough people find their way to the good stuff. And I, 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 I can't believe that it's happening the way we would hope it would. And I think there's a ripple effect down the road that's negative for all of us. You know, um, I, I'll, I'll pick a, an example that you'll, you'll relate to, you know, really well, you know, and I think that is the current trend time that we're living in, which is long layers and the fear mm-hmm. that we hear in conversations about getting the short hair. That's a yeah. very now thing. That's, that's a, that's yeah. a thing that's, it's happened over the last 10 years, you know, but, but in the midst of it, we've created perhaps a, a, a huge percentage of our industry who don't have comfort for what might be the next trend and might yes. keep us from getting to the next trend because we don't have the capabilities to get there. We might block the next trend because, you know, we're yeah. not ready to take it there. So it's, it's interesting when you think it from, from that perspective, and then I'll tie it back to economics because the, sh- the swinging of the pendulum of trend is, is critical to the health of the industry. We need trends to change. We need clients yeah. to, to want to change, you know, um, and, and kind of see themselves in new ways. And when we can't do that, we become a commodity. Yeah. Yeah. I think a good friend of yours and mine, Stephen Moody, mm. uh, we were having a conversation with him and he said, you know, that the industry has shot itself in the foot because – we got everybody to grow their hair. We gave them root extensions mm-hmm. uh, and we gave them colors that they don't have to come back in for. And now we wonder why we can't get people back into our business, you know, and having their color every, you know, six weeks and having regular haircuts, et cetera. And that's, you know, again, is a big part of it. And to your point, I as well as a cutter can see that pendulum swinging yep. and it's going to come back and people are going to get caught out there with uh, not understanding, not knowing how to, how to do that kind of work. Yeah. when you try so, it again to the money, you know, it, it, again, there's all this conversation on social about, you know, these $500 color services, what doesn't get talked about. And I think it's important for the mainstream to understand it. Cause again, economics are complicated, but are those 500 color services to it two times a year? I, I think we need more clients today than we've needed in a long time to be successful because the appointment spreading is real. And so, yeah. You know, if you've got a client that comes in every 12 weeks versus another client who comes in twice a year and you start to do the math of that $500 client twice is $1,000 for the year, but that every 10 to 12 week client at a lower price could get you actually to a higher lifetime value, that becomes complicated, meaning that big ticket can confuse us. You know, that, yeah. oh, I want a whole lot of those big tickets, which we should want, which, which we should really want. But if they only come once or twice a year or they come once and never come back, how is that building a business? Yeah, 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 that's wild. Yeah. That's, um, Gordon, I mean, we, I mean, we, uh, I, I feel that we only even covered just the tip of the iceberg here. <laughs> but um, a lot. for what we've covered in here, what, what, you know, what, what does this mean? I'm just going to wrap this up because we talked about a lot of things. Some of it negative, some of it positive, yeah. and like I talked, there's a there's a bit of a butt pucker um, um, part of the, all of this with yes. people that are listening and watching to us. What's going on? But what what uh, if we had to wrap that up? What would we advice or learning that we would say? Things we need to th- listen and look for. What would you say uh, to the people right now? Well, I'd start by by recognizing. That yes, it's kind of a messy time in, in many ways. The world is messy, right? And when yeah. the world is messy, we're probably going to find our own version of messy within the industry. Uh, chaotic. There's a great quote. I can't remember who said it, you know, but, you know, out of chaos comes opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I really do believe that we live in a time of as much opportunity, if not more than we've ever had throughout my entire career. I mean, people do have the opportunity, as I mentioned, you know, the, the barrier to entry to ownership is the lowest as I think it's ever been. For the masses, that's not necessarily a good thing. I think some people jump too soon. Individually, because there's so many options, when you're being smart about your career, when you're being thoughtful, when you are going out and doing your homework and finding all the information, again, I, I think there's, we've never seen the opportunities that are in front of us. Um, it's just that you got to kind of figure out how to get yourself there and get all the information. So, so I think that's important to say, cause I don't want this to come off as all negative because it's not, yeah. there are so many yeah. opportunities. I'm seeing so many young people who are killing it. Are they the majority? No, that will never be the case. That's a, 
would not be the case of any industry. So I think going back to where we started, knowledge is power. I, th- I think yeah. um, I think we should today more than ever. We need to question the people that we're listening to and ask where they're finding what they find and and thinking about who are they and and context. You know, is 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 kind of king. I think when we just kind of live in our own little space and we don't consider how we fit into the larger space, then potentially we, we miss out on opportunities. So, but blow it all down. I think we live in a time of amazing opportunity. It might be a little more difficult to find our way there than the past because it, because there is so much going on, but, but yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity and, and hope for everybody out there. Yeah. And, and Gordon, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for being on here and, and just to go back, at the very beginning, we talked about how if we really want to understand, you have to understand why. Mm-hmm. And that I always think that this way is having you on here has been the wise, W-H-Y-S, have made us wise, W-I-S-E. And I think that's the whole key to this. If you understand why, you can take a look at it and how does it affect you and make a shift. Yep. You get wise before anybody else, and that why, that wisdom that you get from it helps to propel you forward and keeps you successful. So I just want to say thank you, Gordon. You always are so generous with your time and your knowledge, and you always help us so much. So I just want to say thank you so much for being on here. It's an absolute um, pleasure. And let me say thank you because Head Cases is on my must-listen-to list now. You have evolved this podcast in, in such a cool way. And I love what you're bringing to the industry. So kudos to you for that. And you say butt pucker. <laughs> yes, there you go. Oh, Absolutely. Only on a podcast. I love it. Always only on a podcast. And so thank you. And I really appreciate that plug on there. And by the way, make sure that you're on on Gordon's. Gordon's has amazing podcasts that he does with Beautycast, et cetera, and his own personal so make sure that you're on there. If anybody wants to listen to you more and get more information, where would they go? The easiest place for me is Instagram. Follow me on Instagram. Um, I go by Gordon M, but I spell it G-O-R-D-N-M. Um, that's Gordon. Um, and um, Instagram. And then Social Beauty Makers is my podcast with me talking solo. And then Mastering Beauty is my podcast for Beautycast Network. And those are all great places to find me. And I, and I answer Absolutely. all my DMs. So. Yeah, and I would highly encourage that everybody goes to that and listen to that. Yeah. So listen, uh, all the listeners and and you know if you're on there, whatever platform you're on out there is, uh, if you like what you heard today, and you want to hear more, if you can, you know, just show us some love, give us a review. You know, number five is really good for us uh, to get the algorithms going, etc. And then we can get more people on our site as well. So thank you for that. Thank you, Gordon, and I'm Chris Barron, and I just want to say this has been Head Cases. <laughs>